Hello and welcome back. Previously, you saw how to use the RStudio development environment that makes working with R easier. In this video, we're going to jump into the nitty gritty of the R programming language itself. So get excited and let's go. So what are we going to learn in this lesson? Here is our list of learning objectives. If you like, you can pause the video and read through these, but we will come back to them at the end of the lesson. For now, some quick notes. First, this is going to be an unusually long lesson. So if you like, feel free to pause the video and watch it in sections, take a break, and come back when your brain is refreshed. Secondly, I want you to really type the code along with me as I'm going. This way you'll build it into your memory much more efficiently. Thirdly, I want you to make sure that you pause the video to think as I am coding or as you are coding. Pause the video, play with the code, and make sure you really understand what is going on. And lastly, it will be important for you to watch this video several times. Because we're covering so much material, you won't get it all on the first try. So on the first time you watch it, watch it at the normal speed, but later come back and watch it again at 1.5x speed or 2x speed. Whatever video uh, player you're using, there should be an option to watch things at a fast speed. So try that and see how it goes. So now let's jump into the actual lesson. Now as usual, to get started, I'm going to open up RStudio. I've gone to rstudio.cloud and I'm going to click on this R project here, R intro. If you haven't created a project yet, just click on new project and new RStudio project. If you are on a, a local computer, you're not working on the cloud, you can just go to your applications folder and open up RStudio from there. But for now, I'm going to open up my R intro project here. And that brings me to the RStudio interface here. It seems to have restored my work from the last session, and I actually don't want that. So I'm going to click on Session here, and then Restart R to restart everything. Okay, and now my environment is empty. We also have this last script that we had worked on still open. We can leave that open, it doesn't matter. We can open a new script beside that. So I'm going to click on File here, New File, and New R Script. And now we have a new script we're going to work on. Let's also make this uh, tab a bit larger by clicking on this icon here so that we have a lot of space to write our code. And we're going to save this, uh, this file with Command S or Control S if you're on Windows. Let's save it with a name like a coding underscore basics. The first thing we're going to think about are comments. What are comments in R? There are basically two types of code you could write in R. There are commands, which is telling the computer to do anything. That's a command, so if you write two plus two, for example, and we run that with command enter or control enter, that sends this command to the console and we run that code. So that code was interpreted by the computer. If we want to type a comment instead of a command, we use the hashtag symbol or the pound symbol, this one, okay? And if we type anything after that, it's not going to be evaluated by R. So if I type two plus two after that hash, then you can see nothing ran, okay? So when you put a hash, that turns something into a comment. Comments are useful for humans to read. They're not useful for the computer. They're useful for yourself when you look at the script later on or for your collaborators so they can understand what you did. So generally, when you're writing a comment, you write the comment either above the relevant piece of code. For example, here we can say, the code below adds two numbers, okay? Or you can write the comment on the same line, but after the relevant piece of code. So we could write, this code adds two numbers. So those are the two main ways that you're going to use comments. Now, you should always try to comment your code so that it's clear what your code is doing. Like your mother always says, too much of everything is bad, except our comments. So throughout this tutorial, I'm going to give you short practice questions that I want you to pause and try on your own. I'm going to paste the first one here. It's a very easy question to start with. It says, answer true or false. Both code chunks below are valid ways to comment your code. So here we have this first one and that second one. Is it true or false that these are both valid ways to comment your code? So pause the video, think about it. If you like, you can actually type the question text into your script. And at the end of the video or in a text below the video, I will put all the answers to the questions. So one very nice use of comments is to create section headers. If you type a comment, say something like section one, and then four dashes, one, two, three, four, you get this icon beside the comment, 
which you can click to fold or unfold that section of code. We actually have this for the question one there, so I'm going to click on that button right beside Q1, and as you can see, it folds that section of code. We can click on it again to unfold that section. That's the first beautiful thing about these section headers. The other nice thing is that there's an icon at the top right of your editor, which opens up a document outline. If I click on that, I see a document outline, and I can click on each of those sections to navigate to them. So this will be very helpful for you when you're working on long scripts and you want to jump through different sections. But for now, we're going to close that outline and think about using R as a calculator. So I'm going to type in a new section, R as a calculator. So R can do the basic things you would expect a calculator to be able to do. We can do 2 plus 2, for example, and you can see it shows 4 there at the console. You can do 2 minus 2, of course, 2 minus 2. We can do 2 times 2. To do times, you use the asterisk, okay, 2 times 2. How about divided? 2 slash 2, that's the same thing as 2 divided by 2. Okay, um, how about raised to the power of? You can do 2 raised to the power of 2 using the caret symbol there. Okay, now as you can see in some of these I have a space between the operators, in others I don't have a space. It's really up to you how you do that. An important thing to note is that like any good calculator, R follows the expected order of operations. So for example, if I type the following code, 2 plus 2 times 2, pause the video and think about what will be the answer to this. So if I run this, as you can see, the answer is 6. Why? Because the multiplication is evaluated before the plus. So you have 2 times 2, 4. 4 plus 2 is 6. Now we can also do simple mathematical operations or transformations. For example, SQRT stands for square root, and I can do 100. Square root of 100 is 10. Now this thing, SQRT here, is what's called an R function, where 100 is an argument to that function. We're going to talk a lot about functions later on. Now here's another question for you. I'm going to paste it in. It says, in the following expression, which sign is evaluated first by R, the minus or the division, the minus or the division? And what is the expected answer to that? Pause the video and try it. Now let's spend a minute thinking about code formatting, specifically the use of spaces. So I'm going to copy this and paste that and let's call this a uh, formatting code, formatting code. The main thing I want to talk about is the use of spaces. So if you type something like a 2 plus 2, okay, that evaluates to 4. But, like I said before, you can put spaces between the operators there. And that has the same effect. If you do 2 and then lots of spaces and then another big chunk of space, that's exactly the same thing. So the way you choose to space out your code is completely up to you. Let's look at another example with the square root function. So we had SQRT, and then we had 100. You can type it like that. Or you could do SQRT, and then a space, and then 100, okay? <laughs> the, the way you really should do it is this one, okay? I'm just showing you that you can space it out however you like. Or you can do something like SQRT, and then open parentheses, and then you press an enter, and you put the 100 there, and you run that code. And again, it's the same thing as this first one. You can see we get our nice result there of 10. Now, of course, there are sensible and nonsensical ways to space out your R code. As a beginner, you may not have good intuitions for these, so you can use a little trick. You can highlight any code you want to uh, format nicely. Here, I'm just going to highlight my whole section of code with a command A, and go to this option in R Studio, code, and then reformat code, okay? And it reformats the code in the way that it deems appropriate. So as you can see, it has gotten rid of all the spaces in my square roots, okay? And it added some spaces there as well. So you can always reformat your code that way. Now at this point, I want to pause and acknowledge a common problem that students run into when they're running code. So imagine I'm trying to find the square root of 100 and I type SQRT and then uh, open parentheses and 100. And for some reason, I don't have that closing parentheses there. Okay, let's put in some space, all right? And I try to run this line of code. Let's try to run that line of code. Now look what I have in my console. Instead of the usual um, arrow like that, we have this plus sign. What that plus sign means is that R is waiting for some additional code to wrap up that command. That means that, for example, let's go to the console and press enter. Each time I press enter, I just get another plus. R is still waiting for me to complete that command. If I type something like uh, some random command, like if I want to print um, hello, okay? and I type that, it's going to give me an error because what this is, is turning out to, what this is evaluating to is SQRT 100 print hello, which is invalid code. So if I run that, 
it tells me there's a problem, okay? So whenever you see that plus sign, that annoying plus sign here in the console, it means you've run some incomplete section of code. And how do you get rid of that plus? So to get rid of that plus, you can press escape while you are in the uh, console. So I press escape and I get rid of that plus, and now I'm ready to type in a new line of code. But in this case, as you can see, our studio has actually highlighted that there's a problem with that line of code. So if I hover over it, it says unmatched opening bracket. That's a wonderful piece of information there. So I can close the bracket there, and then I wouldn't have the problem with the annoying plus. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is objects in R, specifically creating objects in R. So let's make a new section and call it a creating objects in R. Now what exactly is an object? When we run code the way we've been doing in the past, the code just gets shown, the output of the code just gets printed on the console. We don't actually store it anywhere. But most of the time when you're doing data analysis, you're going to want to store the things that you create. To do that, you need to assign the values of those things into objects. Let's look at an example. We're going to try to create an object called myobj, myobj, underscore obj, okay? And I'm going to type the assignment operator. What is the assignment operator? It's a less than and then a minus. Less than and minus. And I'm going to assign to it the value 2 plus 2. And I can run that line of code. And it shows me that the code has been run there. And it shows me in the environment that I have a new object, which I called here my obj. Now this assignment operator, we're going to type it many, many times in your R career. So rather than typing less than minus every time, you want to use the shortcut. On Mac, the shortcut is option minus. On Windows, I think it is alt minus, okay? So you type option minus and you get that assignment operator. Let's type two plus two again. Let's run it again, just for good measure. So this is one way you can create an object in R. There is another symbol you can use and that's the equal to sign to create an object. So let's say we want to create an object called, I don't know, another one, okay? And we can type another one equals to maybe three plus three. And we run that, we can see now we have another one there as six. So you shouldn't actually use the equals to sign though. You should use this assignment operator. Now it might seem a bit annoying given that this is much easier to type. For historical reasons, mostly, our programmers prefer to use this one. There are some other good reasons why we prefer to use this one, but it's mostly historical reasons. So we would recommend you stick to the assignment operator. Don't use equals to for assignments. So I'm actually going to delete that line so you do not remember it. Now in order to really drive home the idea of objects, let's consider an analogy. When you type code like this, two plus two assigned to my obj, or actually let's change it to 20 assigned to my obj, what you're doing there is you're creating a kind of named bucket. So here, when you do 20 assigned to my obj, you're saying, get me some bucket and call it my obj, and put the value 20 inside of it. Put the number 20, it reads here, inside an object called my obj. Does that make sense? It's a named bucket, and that means if we want to access the value 20 later on, we don't need to think about what's inside of it. We can just pull that name, and that allows us to get access to what is inside that bucket. If we consider another example, we can create an object called something like first name and assign to it the value Joanna. So I'm going to put Joanna there. And notice the quotes. When I do that, it shows, me, it shows me that in my environment. But by analogy, what we're doing again is the following. We're taking the value Joanna, we're putting it inside an object called first name, which means whenever we want to access that first name, we don't have to get Joanna anymore, we can just pull this object from the R environment. Let's consider one last example. Again, that two plus two that we wrote, let's write it again actually. So my obj, and we're gonna overwrite the old my obj actually, two plus two, all right? And so we can see we've overwritten it there. What we have done there is not exactly similar to this, but a bit different, why? Because we added these two numbers, and it's not literally two plus two that's stored in my obj, it's the result of two plus two that's stored in my obj. So what I wanna explain there is that in this case, the code is getting evaluated first. So it says evaluate two plus two, and then store the result of that evaluation, which is four, in the object called my obj. Hopefully that makes sense. The code always gets evaluated before it gets stored inside of your object, which we're thinking of in these cases as named buckets. Now keeping all that in mind, here is a practice question for you I'm going to paste in. I want you to pause the video and think about this. Consider the code below. Uh, two plus two plus two assigned to result, 
Now answer for me this question. What is the value of the result object that we've created? What is the value of this thing? Is it 2 plus 2 plus 2? Is it numeric? Or is it 6? Pause and think about it. Now let's jump to a new section which I'm going to call data sets are objects too. Let's triple click here so I can highlight that. And then I'm going to change the same to data sets are objects too. Whoops, objects too. Okay, and let's put an exclamation point there. Why do I put an exclamation point? It's because I know you might be getting a bit frustrated. You might be asking, why are we spending all this time talking about this simple primary school math stuff? Isn't this supposed to be a data analysis class? Well, I want you to be a bit patient, okay? The reason we're spending time thinking about these objects in this very uh, elementary way is because when we start working with data sets, they will also be stored as our objects and they will be subject to the same principles that we are discussing. Let's look at an example of that uh, right now. So I'm going to import a new data set into R, the same one we imported in the last lesson, actually. So I paste in this code. Whoops, that's the wrong code. This one here, okay? It's called Ebola Sierra Leone data. And I have the assignment operator, read.csv, https, blah, 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 tinyurl.com slash Ebola hyphen data hyphen sample. Sorry that you have to type all of that out. Now, if I run that line of code, I'm going to import this data set that I stored on Google Drive on the internet. And as you can see, it shows up here also as an object. Hopefully you remember this from the last session. A beautiful thing about this object setup is that you can work with many data sets at the same time in R. In some other data analysis software, you're stuck working on one data set at a time. In this case, you can work on many at the same time. So now I'm going to import another data set from the web, okay? And I paste in this code here. This is a data set uh, on a diabetes in China. So you type this code, read.csv, blah, 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 diabetes hyphen China. Pause and type that up. And I run that code. And that data set has now been imported. So we have two data sets at the same time in our R memory or in the uh, environment. If you want to see what's inside of these objects, you can just send them to the console. I can take this line of code, let's paste it there, and press a command enter. And we've sent that to the console, and so the output of that object actually prints in the console. Let's make that a bit larger. Uh, it's a bit hard to see. Let's run that one more time. Okay, now we can see the tabular looking uh, thing in the console. And we can do the same thing for the diabetes data set. Let's run that here. But the diabetes data set is really quite large, so it's easier to view it in the data viewer. Hopefully you remember how to open that. You type V-I-E-W. Here I'm typing it into the console as opposed to into the script because I don't need it for later. Okay, so view Diabetes China. Okay, and I can see what that data set looks like in this uh, data viewer. I can close that tab for now or I can just click back to our script. So in summary, when you work with the data set in R, you are storing it as an object in the R environment or in your R workspace. And therefore, the things we're going to say about objects apply to the data sets you're going to be working with in R. Now, what happens if you want to rename an object? So I'm going to create a new section and call it object renaming or rename an object. Rename, rename an object. So there's actually no direct way to rename an object. To rename an object, you need to copy the contents of that object into a differently named object and delete the old one. What does that mean? So let's say we want to rename Ebola Sierra Leone data because we decide it's a bit too long. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to type Ebola data. That's going to be our new name. Then the assignment op operator. Then that old name there. And we run that line of code. And what we have done here is we have copied the contents in this bucket, this object, into that bucket, Okay, that new object. And now we need to get rid of this old one so that we only have the new one. So to get rid of the old one, we type RM. Okay, And inside of that those parentheses there, we can put, we can copy and paste that, uh, that object, and we run that line of code. And as you can see now, if we look at our environment, instead of Ebola Sierra Leone data, we now have Ebola data. So we copy the contents from here into here, and then we got rid of that one. And in doing so, we have effectively renamed our object. It's quite painful, but that's the way you do it. Now, what about when you want to overwrite the contents of an object? That is, you want to replace what's inside of the bucket. So let's create a new section and call it overwrite an object. It's really quite simple. Let's look at an example. Remember we had run this code up here that's assigned Joanna to the object first name. Okay, let's rerun that just to remember. Okay, now let's say we want to replace or overwrite this object first name with a new name because we're, we've changed our name or something. <laughs> so we're just going to write a new line of code and put in a new name. Let's say Luigi, for example. And if I run that, notice what's going to happen in the environment. 
in the environments, we're going to change the value from Joanna to Luigi. So we have overwritten the contents of this object. We have gotten rid of the content of the bucket and replaced it with some new content. Now the next thing we're going to look at is how to work with objects. So I'm going to make a new section called working with objects. This will be a short section. Okay. Now you can run simple commands on objects. For example, let's say I wanted to uh, take the square root of a number. Instead of taking the square root of a number directly, I could assign that number to some object. For example, my number there. I run that line of code. And I could take the square root of my number. Okay. And that gives us the expected value there of 10. Hopefully that makes sense to you. R sees the object my number as the value 10, and therefore is able to evaluate its square root. You could also do something like add my number to itself. So I could take my number and add it to my number. I'm pasting that there. And let's assign that to a new object called my sum. Okay. And so what have we done there? If we look in our environment, we can see the value of my sum there is 200. Why? Because I've taken my number, which represents 100, plus my number 100, assigned it to a new object, my sum, which is therefore 200. Now, one small side note, if you want to see the value of an object without looking at your environment, one thing you can do is you can highlight the uh, relevant piece of code in your script, in your editor, and from there press Command Enter or Control Enter on Windows. Okay, and what that does is it sends that object to the console and prints out its output. But of course, most of your data analysis will not involve small objects like this. Rather, you'll be working with uh, data objects, such as the Ebola data object we looked at before. So let's pull that down and see what sorts of things can we do to this object. I'm going to press Command Enter to send it to my console so I can view it here. Okay, then I scroll up. And let's just take a look at some of the variables there. Pause and, and examine this data set so you understand what it's showing. What I'm going to try to do is make a small table that shows the distribution of the patients by sex, by that sex column there. So to do that, I'm going to type the following. Just type along with me. Table, the table function, then Ebola data. Okay, we can press enter with the autocomplete there. And then uh, the dollar sign. The dollar sign will let us see the different um, columns in that data set. And then the one I care about here is sex, so I press enter on that. And we have there our nice table of the distribution of genders. You have 124 women and 76 men. That's just a small preview of what it looks like to work with data sets in R, to work with data objects. We're going to come back to this info in a later lesson. For now, try out this practice question that I'm going to paste in. Okay, So this is a two-part question. In the first uh, part, I want you to consider this code below and think about what is the value of the answer object that is defined here. Just look at the code and see if you can figure it out. And then you can actually type out the code and, and run it. It should be fairly easy for you. I just want to make sure you understand the concept of objects. In the next uh, question, I want you to use the table function to make a table with the distribution of patients across districts in the uh, Ebola data object. So similar to what I've done here, I just want you to do that for the uh, districts. Now the next thing we're going to look at is a common errors with objects. So I'm going to make a new section in my script and call it errors with objects. Errors with objects. The first type of error concerns when you try to do things that are inappropriate to your objects. That's a bit of a weird sentence. Let's see an example. Imagine that I have a, an object first name and I give that the value Luigi, okay? And I have another object last name with the value Fenway, Fenway. And let's run those two lines of code, okay? So now I have those two, two objects, a first name and last name. And what if I try to add them? So I try to do first name plus last name. What do you expect will happen? Well, if I run that, as you can see, we have an error message. It says, error in first name, last name, non-numeric arguments to binary operator. That might sound like gibberish to you, although the word non-numeric there should give it away. It means basically that we're trying to add two things that are not numbers, two things that are non-numeric. So in this case, the way you would actually uh, combine those two strings is you would type paste and then first name, first name, comma, last name, and you can do that, all right? So in this case, it's quite obvious what happened, why this plus generated a, a problem. But in, in the future, when you're actually writing real analysis scripts, you might have defined an object further up in your script, and you, you won't keep a, a good track of its value. You won't remember its value very well. 
And so it won't be this obvious. This is a bit of a silly example, but it's just to demonstrate that specific kind of error. For now, we're going to comment out this line so that our code doesn't generate an error. Generally, you shouldn't save a script that generates an error. That's a bad idea. Now let's look at another kind of error, which concerns a case sensitivity. So you might do something like this. You might create a variable my number, and let's assign to it the value 48. And I use the term there, variable, uh, instead of object. I should have pointed out that objects and variables in R are really uh, synonyms, okay? So you might hear them used uh, in the same context. Okay, so imagine now I try to take that object or that variable and do something to it. So I type my number plus two. If I run this line of code, what do you think is going to happen? Let's, let's see. So I run that line and it says object my number not found. Pause the video and see if you can figure out what went wrong there. If you're paying attention, you should notice that here I have a small m and there I have a big m, okay? And R is case sensitive like most other programming languages. So this and this are not equivalent and therefore R cannot find uh, that my number. So I need to change this to the lowercase my number and then it should work. Now these kinds of errors are the sorts of things you're going to run into fairly frequently at the beginning of your programming career, unfortunately. So you need to become familiar with them and comfortable with them. Now, one thing you should learn how to do is to take, uh, take your error message like that, maybe without this part, without this part that's specific to you, this first name, last name business, just grab that bit, non-numeric argument to binary operator, and put that in Google uh, or your favorite search engine and see what comes up. You'll often see other people run into the same error. The reason we remove this first name, last name business is that that is specific to your own data analysis. So other people's error message won't have that, okay? Later on, we're going to talk about the wonderful forum Stack Overflow and how to post questions there and get answers from the R developer community. For now, let's look at uh, some problems for you, some practice questions for you. So I'm going to paste a couple of practice questions, two practice questions, all right? And if you're paying attention, these should be really quite easy. The first one says uh, that the code below here returns an error. Why does it do that? So read through it and think about why it returns an error. The second one says the code below also returns an error. Again, it's asking why does it return an error? So pause the video, think through these. You can jot down your thinking in your script. Now the next thing we're going to look at is naming objects. How should you name your object? So let's make a new section and call it naming objects, okay? And I'm gonna paste in this quote from someone called Phil Carlton. I didn't pronounce that right, Phil Carlton. It says, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and uh, naming things. I don't know what cache invalidation is, but I know that naming things is hard. Why is naming things hard? Well, because you want your names generally to be both short so that they're easy to type, but also informative so that people can, just by reading the name of your object, for example, this one, they can know what is probably stored inside of that object. So for example, some object like, uh, if we take the, the Ebola data that we imported, if we had imported that and given it some name like um, Ebola data from 2014 outbreak um, in West Africa, that would not be such a great name because it takes too long to type. Although with a code completion uh, with RStudio, this is not actually that painful to type. But in general, your name should be a little bit shorter than that, but they shouldn't be so short that they're meaningless. Like if you, if you imported this data set and you called it just D, that wouldn't be a very helpful uh, name because it doesn't give a sense of what is inside of that object. So as you uh, read other people's code and as you write your own code, you'll get good intuitions for what uh, good names look like. Now for compound names, those are names with more than one word, there are some common conventions that you will see. The first is called a snake case. So with snake case, you write in all lowercase and you divide, it, uh, you divide the words up with an underscore there and that's what we've been using so far. Um, so let's just say snake case uses all lowercase with an underscore and we can define that object or that variable just so you can remember it. Then the other uh, common case is period case. So you, you use a period instead of a, an underscore to separate the words, okay? So uses all lowercase with a period. And then the last common case you might see something called camel case, camel case. It's named after the back of a camel, 
Now, what you have with camel case is that every uh, second word, so you don't capitalize the first word, but every word after that, you capitalize the first uh, letter. So I can write camel case capitalizes new words. So those are the three main ways that you're going to uh, name variables that have more than one word in them. Now let's look at some things that you actually cannot name your objects. It just doesn't work. So one thing you can't do is you can't start your object name with a number. So if you try to do something like this, define an object 2014 data and store in it the value 2. If we try to run that, it says unexpected input in 2014. So that doesn't work. But I can actually pull that number and put it after the data okay, and define it that way. And that actually does work. So you just have to always start uh, with a letter. And the other thing is that object names can only contain letters, underscores, periods, and numbers, and nothing else. So if, for instance, you try to define an object like data-2014, sorry, data-2014, and try to define that as the value 2, it'll give us an error, OK? We don't need to figure out what the error means. It just, it just says this doesn't work. Or if you try to do something like data um, exclamation mark 2014, that will also not work. Okay? And of course, you can't have spaces in your name. So if we try to do data space 2014, that is not a valid name. Now, there is a small secret, though, that you can use to rescue all of these names. If you really want to name your objects these weird things, you could use backticks. So you might need to Google to figure out where exactly a backtick is on your keyboard. But in my case, it is beside the Z uh, letter. So I can put those back ticks there. And then I can actually define that new object. Okay? So there you can see data, hyphen, uh, sorry, data exclamation mark 2014. And I can do the same thing with the space. Okay? But generally, you should avoid uh, doing this. It's not very useful. When it might come in useful is when you have um, columns that come in uh, with your data. And those columns have spaces in them. And you want to refer to those columns. But we'll see that later on. Let's go ahead and try a small practice question. I'm going to paste in this practice question here. Okay? And it says, in the code below, we are attempting to take the top 20 rows of the Ebola data table with this head function here. You don't need to know what the head function is. Just concern yourself with this part here. It says, all but one of these lines has an error. Which line will run properly? So two of the lines have an error, and only one line will run properly. See if you can figure out which line is going to run properly. For now, I'm going to comment out those lines of code so they don't generate any errors in my script. Now, that's something I may have not mentioned yet, actually, is how do you comment out code? So you can just highlight the code and uh, press Command-Shift-C if you are on a Mac or Control-Shift-C if you're on Windows, and that will put your hashtag there and comment out the lines of code. And with that, we are finally done with our discussion of objects. So now we're going to move to the other main citizen of R, which is a function. So, so far we've been mostly talking about objects. Let's think now about functions. So I'm going to start a new section and call it uh, functions. Now most of your work in R is going to involve calling functions. So what exactly are these functions? Let's consider this visual analogy here. We can think of a function as a named piece of code that does something to its input. So you have this function. It contains some code. Who wrote that code? Maybe you wrote that code. You created your own function. Or someone else who wrote a package in R wrote that code. They created that function. But in any case, that function is going to take some input, or what we call in R arguments, and manipulate it somehow, and give you some output. And so far, you've already seen quite a few functions. So let's go back to our script to remind you though of the functions that you've seen. You've seen something like square root, OK? Square root of 100. And we remember that that gives us 10 there. Let's expand our console a little bit. I think we've also seen the paste function. So I can do something like this, paste, and then I am number, and then let's say 2 plus 2. And I think I'm missing a comma there. OK? So the paste function uh, takes these two arguments and pastes them together. Or you've seen a function like plot, actually. So if I tried to plot, for example, the women data set, which we saw in a previous lesson, then I can see the plot uh, out there. So you already kind of have a good idea of what functions are. But let's formalize our discussion of functions. Specifically, let's talk about uh, function syntax. So I'm going to make a new section here and call it basic function syntax. And I hope you're still following along with me. So the standard way to call a function is to provide a value for each argument in a function. To understand, let's, let's type up some, uh, some pseudocode here. 
So the general thing you're going to do is you're going to type the name of the function, function name, then a pair of parentheses, and then you're going to have some argument, argument one, equals to some value, value, comma, argument two, equals to some value, okay? And that's the general form of most functions you're going to call. Let me comment that out since that's not real code. And let's look at a real code example. But let's make a bit more space right now for our uh, script. The concrete example we're going to use here is the head function. What does the head function do? It takes the first few elements of any object that you pass to it. So I'm going to type head. And the first argument for head is x. x just stands for whatever object that you want to take the first few elements of. In our case, let's take the first few elements of the Ebola data object. That's going to be the first few rows of Ebola data. And the second important argument is called n. n basically stands for the number of things that you want to take. So if we want to take the first five rows, we do n equals 5. If we want the first three rows, we do n equals 3. So now I'm going to run that line of code, and let's see the output. Let's expand our console a little bit so we can see the output a bit better. All right, We can see that it gives us the first three rows of that data set. Head x equals Ebola, n equals 3. Now you can actually switch the order of those arguments. Let's, let's scroll down a bit so we can put this uh, code in the middle of our screen. So head, okay, head, and then we can type n equals 3, and then x equals Ebola data, okay? And that should give us the exact same output. So the first three rows of the Ebola data set. Now by default, the first argument in the head function is this x, is this thing you want to take the head of, and the second argument is the n. Because of that default, we can actually skip writing the uh, name of the argument. So instead of writing head x equals Ebola n equals 3, we could write head Ebola data comma 3, and that's the exact same thing. So if we run that, we also get the top three rows. But if you try to do that in this order, with n equals 3 x Ebola data, you get rid of the, the name of the argument, then you're going to get an error. Because what this is telling R is get me for the three objects, get me the top Ebola data rows, which obviously does not make any sense. Now, how do you figure out the correct order of the arguments? You can simply consult the help of that function. So if I do question mark head, then I can see the help for this function. And we can see here, for example, that it goes x, then n, okay? Or if we scroll down a bit, we can see the arguments x is an object and n is an integer. So this gives you the order of the arguments. And it can tell you whether or not you can do something like this three Ebola data. It explains basically why this does not work. So because that line does not work, I'm going to comment it out. Okay, and I'll also comment out this uh, question mark thing there. Now, an important thing is that some uh, functions have default values. Sorry, what I mean is some arguments have default values. So the default value for the n argument is actually six. What that means is if I run something like this, head x Ebola data, and then no n argument, okay, then I return the top six rows because the default value of n is six. And you can see that default value again in that help file. So if I look here, you can see here in this, in this line here that it goes head x n equals 6L. 6L, L is just a symbol for uh, integers in R. We'll come back to that later on. But basically, this is telling you that the default value of n is 6. And I'm going to ask you a small question, or a question 7 here out of 10. So the question is, in the code lines below, we are attempting to uh, take the top six rows of the women data set, which is built into R. Which line is invalid? One of these lines is invalid and will not do what we want it to. Pause the video and see if you can figure that out. Now the last thing we're going to talk about with functions is the concept of function nesting. So let's make a section and call it a function nesting. Whoops, function nesting. And we're going to expand a bit our console since we uh, reduced it too much, okay? Now what is function nesting? Function nesting is basically when you take the output of one function, or rather you take one function and put it inside of another function. Not necessarily the output of the function, but the function itself. So what does that mean? Let's, let's see an example. So I introduce you now to a function called two lower. What does two lower do? Let's see what it does. I'm going to type two lower Luigi. Make sure you're typing along with me. 
And as you can imagine, this is going to convert Luigi uppercase, whoops, why is he giving me those warning messages? You can ignore those. Luigi uppercase to uh, lowercase there. So it converts uppercase to lowercase. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to nest this code or nest this function inside of another function. So I'm going to type the following paste, okay? My name is, and then I'm going to get this stuff here and put that after the comma. And as you can imagine, when I run this or when you run that, you're going to get the, the uh, output, my name is Luigi. So what we have done is we have nested this function inside of that larger function. And because we have rainbow parentheses turned on, you can easily see the matching brackets. You can easily see which parentheses closes which other one. So we have the orangish parentheses in there, and then you have the uh, pinkish ones outside. Now the alternative to function nesting in this case would have been to assign an intermediate variable or an, or an intermediate object. So I could have done something like this, to lower Luigi, and then assign that to an object called, say, like my lowercase name, my lowercase name. Okay, so I could run that. And then now my lowercase name has the value, whoops, my lowercase name has the value Luigi. Okay, so I can then do paste, I copy and paste that. And instead of to lower Luigi inside of there, instead of the function nesting, I could put this object there, put that value there, okay? So hopefully you see the similarity between this and this. Here I took the function itself and I nested it, but here I pre-assigned an intermediate variable and I put that in there. Function nesting and the assignment of intermediate variables are going to become very important in the rest of the uh, data analysis you're going to be doing with R. So now I have another practice problem for you. I'm going to paste that in there, okay? And let's expand our script. So question eight says, the code lines below are all examples of function nesting, but one of those lines has an error. Which line is it and what is the error? So pause the video and read through those and see if you can figure out what the error is. And of course, you should really just type out the code and see if you can identify the error that way. So now we've talked about comments, we've talked about objects, we've talked about functions. Let's now talk about packages, which I already introduced you to in the last lesson. So I'm going to make a new section in my code and call it packages, okay, packages. And let's go ahead and install a new package. Hopefully you remember how to install packages. We have the function here, install.packages, okay. And I'm going to install specifically the table one package. So I run that code and let's expand our console to see what's happening. And now once that's done installing, you actually want to comment out this code from your script so that R doesn't install the package every time you run the script. So we'll comment this out, or you could just delete it, but I'll comment it out. And now we need to use the library command or the library function to actually load the package. So we type library, okay, table one. And what that'll let us do is actually use the functions from the package. The function from table one we're going to use is called create table one, create table one, okay? And we're going to use the data argument in uh, this function, data equals, we're going to use our Ebola data object, so Ebola data. If we run that, we can see the nice output there. Okay, it looks a bit scary, but if we go to the top, it should become clear what we have. We have basically uh, a table that describes the sample. So we have the number of people in the sample, n equals 100. We have the mean ID, that's actually meaningless because ID is not a, uh, sort of useful variable. We have the mean age, we have the sex uh, breakdown, you can see that uh, we have 38% uh, of them are men, and so on. So if you're publishing a paper or you're working in academia, this is the type of table that you usually put at the start of your paper. And you can do that with a single function there, create table one. Of course, this table is not fully ready for publishing yet. You need to get rid of this date variable there, and maybe you need to get rid of that ID. But as you can see, it's fairly simple to get that fairly complex piece of data analysis. So the point of showing you this here is to show you how rich R is. There are tens of thousands of R packages being developed by thousands of different developers, and many of these packages could be helpful to your data analysis. Now, how do you learn about R packages? You can just Google top 20 R packages or something like that. Another good place to find nice R packages is on Twitter. If you follow the RStats hashtag, you'll usually run into some cool packages, so I really recommend that. Now let's talk about what I call full signifiers. So full signifiers for, uh, for functions. So generally, you can just write a uh, function name like this, create table one, blah, 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 blah. But sometimes it is helpful, 
or useful to put the name of the package before you put uh, the name of the function. So you could write this table one and then two colons, two colons, all right? And you can run that line of code and it does the same thing. I don't know why it keeps giving me this error message, <laughs> which I don't care too much about. So this line of code has the same effect as doing that. There's two important differences though. One is this is more explicit. And so it's very easy for someone to know where you got a function from if you type this out. So sometimes uh, you see other developers write code like this. The other reason is that if you do this, you actually don't have to use the uh, library line in your code because this is telling R exactly where to get that function. So you don't have to pull this thing out of the library first. This pulls it out of the library, okay? So now here's a second to last question for you to answer. It concerns packages, okay? So here I say, consider this code below, okay? Which of the following is the correct interpretation of what that code means? Pause the video and see if you can figure it out. This is just a test of your understanding of R lingo. And now the last thing I'm going to talk about with packages is the package called uh, Pacman. Okay, so let's make a new section in our code and call it Pacman. Pacman stands for Package Manager. It is a package that helps you manage other packages. So let's first go ahead and install that package. Instead of running the code from our script, I'm going to type it in here actually in the console. Install.packages uh, Pacman, and we need the quotes there. And once that's done installing, I can load library pacman. Actually, I'm not going to load library pacman. I'm going to use the full signifier uh, that we just learned about. So I'm going to do pacman a colon colon and then pload. There's a function from pacman called pload. Now, what does pload do? Pload is the power horse or the workhorse of the pacman package. What it does is, if you give it any package, for example, we're going to try now the outbreaks package it is going to do the following. It's going to check whether that package is available on a user's computer. If it's not available, it will install that package by running install.packages in the background. But if it's available, then it won't do that install. And then once it has installed it, it will load the package. So it both installs, if not yet available, and then loads. So as you can imagine, this saves you quite a bit of work or quite a bit of code. So if we run this now, it's going to install the outbreaks package, okay, and it's also going to load it. So doing this is equivalent, therefore, to doing install.packages, okay, outbreaks, whoops, outbreaks, and then library outbreaks, okay? And as you can imagine, if you have many packages to install slash load, you might have to write this line many times. But with Pacman, you can just put a comma there. Let's get rid of this. Put a comma and type the name of some other package that you care about. For example, let's imagine we want to make sure we've loaded table one, so we could do that, we could run that. And because both these packages have already been installed, when I run this line of code, nothing is happening, okay? Because Pacman is intelligent and has figured out that I don't need to install those packages. So Pacman is really what you should use when you are uh, installing packages and loading them in R. This is what we definitely recommend. There is one small extra devilish detail though. Imagine that I sent just this line of code in a script to someone, okay? This should work for them if they already have Pacman installed. If they don't have Pacman installed though, then we need some way of telling their system or telling R to install Pacman for that person. And we can't use Pacman pload because Pacman is not yet installed. So there's a line of code that I'm gonna paste in. You don't have to understand the code for now. You can just copy and paste it into your scripts. So let me paste that in, okay? And now I'll actually read the code. It says, if do not require pacman, install.packages pacman. It's basically checking if pacman doesn't exist on this person's computer, install it. And once pacman now is installed, then I can use this to handle all my other packages. So in general, this is the piece of code you should put at the start of every analysis script to make sure that the necessary packages are installed and loaded on a user's computer. And now I have one final question for you. It's a bit of a tautological question. Basically, it's what I just said. I just want to make sure you're still listening because we have gone through a lot, okay? So what is this question? It says, at the start of an R script, we would like you to install and load the package janitor. For example, hypothetically, which of the following code chunks do we recommend you should have in your script? So which of those, based on what I've just said so far, which of these is what we recommend for making sure that uh, the package janitor is installed and loaded Pause the video, think about it, and write some notes in your script.
So here are the objectives that we had set out at the beginning of the lesson. Let's see if you have achieved them. We wanted you to be able to write comments in R. Can you do that? We wanted you to be able to create section headers in R slash RStudio. Okay. Now you should hopefully know how to use R as a calculator. Now you should understand how to create, overwrite, and manipulate R objects. You should also understand the basic rules for naming R objects. Hopefully you remember that. You should also understand the syntax for calling R functions. How to use R functions and R arguments. Next, you should know how to nest multiple functions. And you should also understand the idea of assigning intermediate objects. And finally, by now, you should be able to install and load add-on R packages and call functions from these packages. If you don't feel like you've grasped all of these, try watching the video once more, maybe at a faster speed, 1.2x or 1.5x, and see how that goes. But also, you don't have to understand it 100%, because we're going to re-encounter these topics as we move on to actual data analysis lessons. So with your new knowledge of our objects, our functions, and the packages that those functions come from, you are ready, believe it or not, to do some basic data analysis in R. We're going to jump into that headfirst in the next lesson, so I will see you there. Bye-bye. For more resources, visit our website, where you can track your progress, access interactive quizzes and lesson notes, and connect with our teachers and other learners like you. And if you'd like a more guided experience, we also offer live online boot camps with expert help. So join us at thegraphcourses.org to start your learning journey today.